This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by String Cheese. Do you wish cheese were phallic? Try String Cheese today. What a week on the poles of the earth, and no, this has nothing to do with Magic Mike. First, there were simultaneous heat waves in the Arctic and Antarctica, and then the Conger Ice Shelf, an ice shelf in eastern Antarctica the size of Los Angeles, collapsed. And what was the headline? Oh right, scientists were flabbergasted. Good Wednesday morning, I'm Ethan Brown, and this is Tip of the Iceberg, where I will break down some environmental news and then answer a question from our listeners on the air. Submit questions via Patreon, email, or social media. Patron questions go to the front of the line, so sign up at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. That was the Washington Post who said scientists are flabbergasted. And yes, they were surprised. Without knowing firsthand, just reading tweets and interviews with scientists over the last several days, I'm going to try to explain why this was surprising, and why being surprised does not mean they're scared out of their minds. Think of it as a surprise party where the party is unexpected and unsettling, but ultimately has the perfect mix of nachos and karaoke. But first, what exactly happened? On March 18th, the average temperature in Antarctica was 8.6 degrees Fahrenheit above average for this time of year. At the Concordia Research Station, temperatures rose to 70 degrees Fahrenheit above average. The average is negative 60. On the 18th, it hit a scorching 10. Some scientists actually took a picture with their shirts off to commemorate the occasion, shedding their 27 layers and reintroducing their nipples to the sun. This heat wave was most likely caused by an atmospheric river, which is a narrow corridor of water vapor traveling through the sky, making its way over Antarctica, and then getting trapped by a high pressure system out of which it can't escape, so temperatures spike. This is called a heat dome. It's the same thing that happened in the Pacific Northwest last summer and on Fairly Odd Parents. You thought Doug Dimsdale's Dimmodome didn't have to do with the environment? Think again. Could climate change have caused this sequence of events? It might have. It might have played a role. But as usual, it's difficult to draw that direct correlation. And I would caution against it until scientists are sure one way or the other. Simultaneously, temperatures in the Arctic rose 6 degrees Fahrenheit above average, with some areas seeing spikes of up to 50 degrees above average. At this rate, the Arctic will be a tropical oasis and your aunt's going to fantasize about moving there. It's worth noting that the Arctic is warming three times faster than the rest of the world due to climate change, so heat waves are actually somewhat common there, especially at this time of year when we're getting into warmer weather in the Northern Hemisphere. So even though the twin heat waves makes for a fun news headline, just like the twins in The Shining make for a fun chance to traumatize Ethan in his college philosophy of film class, We can't say climate change caused the twin heat waves. We can say climate change made something like this a lot more likely, and that's really significant. But these are still two separate events. The Antarctic one is way more unusual than the Arctic one, just looking at recent trends. Then the Conger Ice Shelf collapsed. If only this shelf was covered by an IKEA warranty. The good news is... This ice shelf is not the one holding back the Thwaites Glacier, which, as you may remember, would cause massive global sea level rise. The Conger Ice Shelf actually isn't all that consequential at all. If you look at a map, Conger is pretty small compared to the other ice shelves. 
Maybe collapsing was its way of overcompensating. Conger was holding back glaciers from feeding ice into the ocean, but not anything that would cause drastic sea level rise. The not-so-good news is this happened in eastern Antarctica, which is supposed to be the stable part of the continent. It's western Antarctica that's always been the big concern. It would certainly have grander implications than those of the Conger Ice Shelf alone if this collapse leads to more instability in eastern Antarctica. The last thing we want is eastern Antarctica hovering over your phone at 3 a.m. asking who Lisa is. Did climate change or the heat wave cause the collapse of the Conger Ice Shelf? A lot of people jump to link the two, but as usual, scientists need time to figure that out. It could be due to record low levels of sea ice, which climate change would play a role in too. It could have been the wind from the atmospheric river rather than the heat. There's a number of ideas floating out there, many involving climate change or the heat wave. But whatever scientists find the cause to be, there will inevitably be nuance. It's never just a two-word explanation, like Earth hot or Glacier bad or your mom. So what about those scientists are flabbergasted messages? There is truth to that, but I worry it came off like scientists don't know what's going on, which isn't the case. Michael Mann, one of the world's leading climate scientists who we've covered before, said models have done a good job projecting the overall warming, but we've argued that extreme events are exceeding model predictions. In other words, even Bella Hadid couldn't have predicted this. But Dr. Mann is right. We can easily do the projections to construct a graph that shows the average global temperature for years into the future. We can approximate what the overall climate will do and be pretty spot on. It's significantly harder, though, to say what is the temperature going to be next Tuesday in New York. We can look back to that date every other year and take an average. We can try to project out based on what incoming weather systems we can track. We can count the number of street vendors making food that turns the air all warm and smoky. But that gets really tricky. Given how unprecedented extreme events like this heat wave are, you can see why scientists might find them surprising. It's not that they can't explain them, It's that they just haven't seen them before, and our models aren't as equipped to predict those as they are to predict long-term trends. But just because scientists are surprised doesn't mean they're freaking out necessarily, and that's where I think some people might be overreacting. I read tweets from non-scientists saying, The world is entering a new era that is hostile to species like us, that it will turn into an extinction-level event. That humanity is our own worst enemy. The list goes on and on. Now, these heat waves and this ice shelf collapse are a big deal. It's scary to see the Earth reach extremes like these. At the very least, we can say climate change made these events a lot more likely to happen, and we may find an actual causal relationship. But can we pump the brakes a little? Like, 10%? I get that there's something about ice melt that makes us feel hopeless in a way that maybe isn't the case with other environmental issues. It's far away, it's out of our control, and once an ice shelf like the Conger ice shelf collapses, it is gone. It will never grow back. It's like a receding hairline or Borders bookstore. But even acknowledging all that, there is a lot left in our power. We can reduce carbon emissions to prevent the problem from getting even worse. We can measure how much sea level rise will result from this collapse and plan accordingly. We are very lucky that scientists can figure this stuff out in advance so we can decide what we want to do. If that's seawalls and jetties and sand piles, if that's moving away from coasts, if that's preserving and restoring mangroves and seagrass meadows as a buffer, whatever adaptation you may like. So when we call something like the Conger Ice Shelf Collapse or these twin heat waves the start of a new doomsday extinction-filled mosquitoes run wild PlayStationless era, we're completely ignoring all of this power we have to address the situation, and ignoring that doesn't sit well with me. 
Even with a scary week of extreme climate events like this one, I hope people can remain hopeful and vigilant and not get too pessimistic. We can't make things perfect, but we can absolutely make them better. Do you wish mozzarella cheese were worse? If so, string cheese is for you. With string cheese, you can raise methane belching cows, take their milk, make it into a solid rod, and tell everyone to eat it. What's more, each piece of string cheese can be individually wrapped in plastic, so each time you eat one, you can contribute to the global plastics issue. Wow, if only we could wrap all the plastic-wrapped rods in an even bigger bag made out of plastic. String cheese, the snack that doesn't even fill you up a little bit. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to Tip of the Iceberg. It's time for Ask Me Anything, where our listeners get a chance to ask me any environmental questions they may have. Submit questions on our Patreon, email, or social media. Questions from patrons go to the front of the line, so be sure to sign up today at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. Today's Ask Me Anything comes from Sarah Tekche, who asks, Is climate change causing the migration of larger spiders, and other bugs for that matter, north in the U.S.? I've read about the Joro spider and others that can withstand cold and mild temperatures making their way to the northeast. I will either get reassurance or be scared out of my mind. Thanks for the question, Sarah, and for bringing up this spider story that went somewhat viral a few weeks ago. So yes, climate change is affecting spiders, but not in a uniform way. There was a paper in the journal Physiological Entomology on February 17th that found the Joro spider, as you referenced, can survive colder temperatures and could show up in the Northeast. Emphasis on could. The Joro spider is actually a pretty cool looking spider as far as spiders go. They've got beautiful yellow, blue, and red markings. It's still a spider, but we'll take what we can get. The study demonstrated that 20 out of 27 Joro spiders tested were able to survive for several minutes in a lab at below freezing, which suggests they could handle a cooler climate. The study did not test Joro spider eggs, nor did it test how the spiders would respond to the different parasites found in the Northeast. So this study doesn't conclude that Joro spiders will invade the Northeast, just that the adults could survive a Northeast climate. The quickest way they could make the journey is somehow transporting with humans, but if left to their own devices, they have to literally parachute their webs and catch drifts of wind to travel mile by mile. It's pretty impressive, but it's not like they can just fly across the country. It's a bit of a process. But let's say, for sake of argument, that they do show up in the Northeast and can handle the new environment. I always have to present the nuance, but honestly, I wouldn't find that too surprising. What does that mean? For people, absolutely nothing. The Joro spider does not harm people at all. They're pretty timid toward humans, actually. Their fangs aren't even big enough to penetrate human skin. And if you're afraid of spiders, which is totally reasonable, worst case scenario, they'd still be up against a lot in this new environment. They'll have to compete with other spiders for food and resources. Either they beat out other spiders, other spiders beat them out, or something in between. But they would likely become prey for birds and other animals and settle in, rather than repopulating like crazy. So the total number of spiders in the Northeast likely wouldn't go up. And even if it did a little bit, that just means more bugs are being eaten by them, which is a win in its own right. So I wouldn't be too worried about the Joro spider. They actually seem pretty chill. As for other climate impacts on spiders, there was one study that said cyclones would make a species called the group living spider more aggressive. That made some headlines too. But by aggressive, 
They meant aggressive toward other spiders and other insects. They'd eat more food, they'd cannibalize each other, but again, they were doing nothing to people. Where I think the true concern lies is less so in a case like the Joro spider, and more so in the cases where spider populations are decimated because of a climate event. Heat waves or small temperature increases can wipe out populations of certain spider species, and that can have a major effect on their ecosystems and consequently, us. For example, there's a species called the ladybird spider. The females reach sexual maturity when they've eaten a certain amount of food. They just chill out in their nests. The males reach sexual maturity when temperatures reach a certain level, and they go out and find the females. Their life cycles are timed out, so these two things happen in the spring around the same time. Now, enter a winter heat wave. The male spiders come out ready for action, and the females aren't ready. Suddenly, all the males die without mating. So if you're afraid of spiders, I'm sure that sounds awesome, but think about the implications of that. Spiders, among many other perks, eat a lot of other insects. Without spiders to control those insect populations, smaller insect populations can explode. Mosquitoes are one of the insects spiders can eat, and if you remember back a few episodes ago, mosquitoes are the deadliest animal in the world due to malaria and other diseases they spread. So as scary as the headlines are that say spiders are thriving, I actually find it more concerning when they're not. Spiders generally leave people alone, and I can't say the same about other insects. Thank you so much for the question, Sarah. And just because I had so much fun learning about spiders today, I'll give you one more bonus interesting case of spiders and climate change. A 2018 study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found that climate change was making Arctic wolf spiders bigger. Uh-oh. That one made the news, too. Turns out, one of the Arctic wolf spiders' favorite foods is the springtail. It is an arthropod that feeds on fungus. But when the Arctic wolf spider grows, they lose their appetite for the springtail, which means there are more springtails to gobble up fungi. This creates a cascading effect. You might have heard of the permafrost, which is a layer of soil in the Arctic that has trapped huge amounts of greenhouse gases, and as the permafrost thaws, it releases those greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, exacerbating climate change. But to release the greenhouse gases, the permafrost needs to be decomposed. And you know who does that? Fungi. So the arctic wolf spider gets bigger, and it stops eating springtails. So there's more springtails to eat fungi. And that means there's less fungi to decompose the permafrost. That means when the arctic wolf spider gets bigger, it is actually helping stave off climate change. And that's where I'll leave off for today. Thanks for listening to Tip of the Iceberg. Take two minutes, help out the show, and get a shout-out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. You get merch, bonus content, and your questions move to the front of the line for Tip of the Iceberg. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the hosts and guests. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions or views of Peril and Promise or the WNET group. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you on Friday for a deep dive on carbon capture.